Um, as uh, Jerome already said, I will talk today about critical species and studies. And this work uh, has dragged on now for some years, but has gained momentum the last four years. So I started this all with uh, bachelor students who did bits and pieces. And then when I moved to Norway, uh, the first PhD I got was Jose, and uh, he did most of the work I will be presenting today. So it's mostly his work uh, you will see today, and with some pieces uh, by bachelor students, I will acknowledge them at the end. So uh, I will talk to you today about Stygo capitella, and uh, Stygo capitella is a pygodrillid. You can see here it's here, it's sister to orbinate, and this has been uh, shown now to be the case in quite a lot of different um, Studies. The last one was by Martin Durand et al., which is, has been published this year in Bio uh, Archive. And they are analysts, and as you can see, they are well nested within all these uh, larger analysts, so it's clearly that they secondarily adapted to the interstitial habitat. So um, originally they were bigger. So, what are these? I don't know if you have ever met them. Maybe if you work with oligokites. You might have run into them. Maybe you have thought they were oligokites and he trait, uh, but they are not. They are polychaetes. Um, they are not really myofauna because they are a little bit bigger than usual myofauna, but they live in the interstitial space. Uh, they have body length from 1.5 to 2.9 millimeters. Uh, they have a very characteristic prostomium, which you can see here, which is kind of set apart and where you can really uh, from separate them from antitraces, first of all, for their body size, they are thicker, so a little bit more stout. They are uh, whitish in appearance, and then they have at the first uh, keter bearing segment, you have this very long keter. You can't see it, but it goes all the way back till here. And it's whip-like. And uh, this is very characteristic for them, then in contrast to, for example, other oligokites, uh, all these ketal pairs are on the ventral side. Uh, for, with respect to their biology, they are gonochoristic and have eternal fertilization. So we have male and female and they internalize fertility. Uh, they have a direct development in gel packages. So the eggs are deposited, the fertilized eggs in a gel package, which is attached to sand grain. And there's no known pelagic stage in their life cycle. So with that, they should have very limited active dispersal capacity. Where can we find them? They are on the beaches. They are on sandy beaches. I mean, they're called marine organisms, but in, the, in a way they're in the gray zone because you find them usually around the high water line or higher. And they're at a depth from one to 90 centimeters. So sometimes we have to uh, dig quite deep to find them. They have a global distribution. We can find them everywhere in the world except for the tropics and subtropics. So they have a bipolar distribution in a way. The record is relatively sparse in the southern hemisphere, but I think that's the problem of collecting efforts which have taken place there. Uh, for example, here in South Africa, I will come to that in a little bit, um, there's a new record which I found when I just started to dig in a beach there, then they popped up. And we have that quite often when we look at beaches now that we find them. And with that, we have this global distribution that was so supposed to be one species only. So with a cosmopolitan distribution, we don't have an uh, active dispersal stage. So it's kind of an example of the myofauna paradox. But like with many organisms of this myofauna paradox, they turned out to be not that quite distributed, which I will show you today. Jose also has written a um, review on the myofauna paradox. If you want to look into this a little bit more, then you could look at the marine biology paper from him in 2018 where we look a little bit on how valid the myofauna paradox actually still is. That, that might be not that clear that it's a global uh, cosmopolitan distribution for this one species, Thyrocapitella subterranea. Uh, there was first indications of that date is wrong. It was in 2000, I just see. So it was schmidt westheide in the look description in 2000. There they used rapid data and uh, found that uh, populations from Nahant in the US Atlantic coast, Zylt at the German uh, Atlantic coast, and from San Juan Island in the Pacific, one population there, 
uh, that they were reciprocally monophyletic and also the Atlantic ones were more closely related to each other than to the Pacific ones. The problem with this study is only one population per coastline and it's not quite clear if these are different species or if they are maybe just population structures we see here just to the huge uh, distance between them. And with that in mind, uh, I started to collect more of them, first around uh, Europe and we extended that now and that where then when the bachelor students came in, they did sequencing of different uh, individuals for their uh, honor theses at the bachelor. So when they were like three months in the lab, they could do a little bit on it. And so with that, we scrapped little bits of pieces over the years together. And the first population which came out of them was then uh, 2017, uh, where after I found the one species from South Africa, which is this one, which turned out to be quite different. It's much smaller than the ones we knew from Europe. Uh, and also get some hands on of species from Australia. And when we looked at more detail with them, we found, okay, here you see clearly there's the differences. They have a different body shape. Here are some keto missing in this one. They are much smaller. Uh, also their body structure is missing. Uh, what these lack, for example, is these don't have these poor keto you can see here. They're lacking. All of them have this whip keto, so it's the style capitella. Um, and then, but also we found differences between the Australian ones and the subternian ones. It's uh, minimal. They have, subternia has here one more bilum based keto it's called, and here also one more bilum based keto. And that's the only differences we could find. Uh, we also looked then at molecular data and we did this with CO1 and 18S. And what you can see here is now also with the molecular data, we could clearly separate them with the Australian group in here. Here we have the European samples and here is the South African sample. So with that, we then in 2017 went ahead and described them as two new species. So increasing the number from one to three. And what we also looked in is how does the morphological disparity fit to molecular disparity? And uh, what we found is that at least with 18S, there's a clear linear regular, uh, correlation between morphological disparity and the molecular divergence we measured in 18S. So that seems to be relatively nice and well. So it looks really nice. Um, and it seems to correlate with each other. But one has to have in mind that 18S is a very slowly evolving gene. So it's not like CO1 or so, it's fast evolving. This might already be an indication that evolution is not going on that fast in this group. So this was kind of the background knowledge when you say started to see this. And you see then started to expand uh, the whole study. And I like this picture or this representation of the Earth. It's a projection from the South Pole. And it kind of shows you how the seas are interconnected with each other. And uh, yeah, maybe get a little reduced. So we collected samples from the North American Atlantic coast. We have quite a lot of samples from Europe, also from the North American uh, coast. We included Southern Hemisphere samples from Australia and uh, South Africa. And we had a new record um, in 2019. We were there, we were at the, um, in Vladivostok. And so we got the first record from the East Sea, or from the Eastern Pacific part, or yeah, East Asia. The say uh, investigated 353 specimens from 36 populations in total, and we used four different markers. And uh, when we analyzed these with different approaches, what we found is uh, that in all in all, we can differentiate 12 species between them. If we look uh, at different methods with each gene, uh, they are congruent with each other, the four genes and the results they get. So these were kind of the 12 genes. And we looked a little, we took a conservative approach. You can, for example, see here, with some methods, we got more splitting, uh, but we stayed with the most conservative, just to be on the safe side. In total, that meant uh, there are nine species new to science. Uh, eight of these we could formally describe, uh, one we could not. This is um, this one here, which is called, still is called species A. Because um, we only find, did find them in sympathetic population and in one which was allopatric. But unfortunately from this allopatric population, we had only one individual which we needed to use for our molecular approach. So we hadn't anything which we could clearly assign as a holotype for this species. And that's the only reason why we didn't describe it yet. I did some collecting more since then and I hope that then we will be able to describe that soon. 
out of this 12 species, seven were formally assigned uh, to Styrocapitella subterranea. Um, the other thing which we looked in, in is now into morphology. And what we found is that we only have four morphotypes. We have still this one, which is not shown here in these three figures. The one which you can see here from South Africa, which I showed before, which is this very small one, very different from the others. These were all relatively similar. The overall morphology is the same. The only difference is what we find here in the ketal pattern. And here, that's the one from Australis, which I explained before. Here is a classical subterranean one. And here's a new one we found where, in comparison to the subterranean pattern, we have here one more phylum based keter. So, in total, when we look at it, it's only like here, this is the only differences we find. It's very little, it's only uh, slight differences in the number of keter we find between these. We also looked into morphometric measurements, so body size, body length, um, uh, body width, uh, pygidium length, pygidium width, prosomium length, prosomium width, so what we could measure. And then we looked at it statistically within each of these four morphotypes. And you see here, like within this, uh, what we call the red morphotype, uh, the Australis one, we could not statistically separate them in body length. We could see some separation between some species uh, in uh, the new morphotype we had found, the blue one. But on the other hand, this one is connecting them both. So we could not statistically separate them with certainty. In this one, there's two which are with morphometrics uh, similar and others are a little bit bigger. We also look into this with a uh, principal component under this. This is all species together. And you see that with morphometric measurements, there's a lot of overlap. If we go by morphotypes, they are separating a bit, but for example, here we had only two species, so that's a very low sampling point. When we have more, we usually see there's usually a lot of overlap between them. So also with morphometric measurements, we cannot really differentiate them. So considering morphotypes and the morphometric measurements, uh, it's very hard to differentiate them, if not impossible. Some are identical. And uh, so all in all, they're extremely similar. So we don't find much differences between them. And with that, we then start to look uh, more into the morphological uh, evolutionary rate. And yeah, this is what kind of, this is for a um, summary chapter we are writing now for a book on analytes where I summarize what's known about paragrylids. That's why also the other the sister species to start capital is in there. That's kind of what we know about them. These is the known 12 species. And here you see that's the one general morphology where you see where we have eight ketigers, whereas here we have 10 ketigers. Otherwise, they are relatively similar except for body size. Here you see then the other differences are just within these uh, keto patterns, and that's relatively similar. All of these ones here from the third one, this is this one, they have the exact same. Patterns. There's no differences in that any longer. So it's just restricted to the first two segments with only very little keto. This is in uh, implications for their um, distribution. So what was for supposed to be a cosmopolitan species is not quite uh, that longer anymore. So Styrocapitella is everything on this map, which is a triangle. And you see now we have different colors in different parts of the world, and there's some which we don't know because we lack molecular data uh, where they actually belong to. So they have an uncertain species status. And also when we look at Europe or US East Coast or Pacific Coast, you always see um, that there are different color shapes here relatively closely. If we look into a little bit more detail, for example, here in Europe, we see some are relatively close to each other, but we also have some patrick populations. Here are, we have two species which occur on the same beach, or here are three species on the same beach. And here, sympatry is really uh, also on the micro level. They occur within the same 50 cubic centimeter of sediment where we found them. So it's really, that's, I would say, really sympatry. It's not just that maybe one at 10 centimeters depth and the others at 90 centimeters depth. They occur in the same depth in 50 cubic centimeters of sand. And the same is, for example, here true also for Germany, but also in the US, where we found them here, that's Lubeck, close to the uh, Canadian border, where we found them, and here it's on Friday Harbor. There we have also one beach where three of them occur.
curve. And you see here on this small island, San Juan Island is not that big. We have uh, one, two, three, four different species occurring there alone. And also where we find them at beaches and what kind of beaches has uh, changed our perspective now. Um, this was what they were thought to be living in. This is a sandy beach with the medium coarse sediment size. So this is when you look like from the sea of it, or here's a, a beach in Australia, Sarge Bay. So this is where it was usually thought to be. But however, this is for example in a fjord in Norway, where also species of them occurs. Um, here's other species. Uh, this is in San Juan Island, and these are also two in San Juan Island, where you see here it's even finer sediment than we can find here. Here we have uh, a lot of stones on it. So they occur at very different beaches. The thing is um, we cannot separate them based on this ecology. We find uh, this is, for example, here, uh, no, this beach here, that's where the three species occur together. So we cannot separate them based on this, which you might have seen, uh, thought maybe that's the ecological differentiation. We did some ecological, macroecological tests on it and we did, could not find any uh, ecological parameters which separate them. At least for now, what we did not include was, uh, for example, Ghanu military or so that we still need to do. But for, therefore, we need to get first all the samples from this. What we looked then also a little bit more into is their morphological evolution. And therefore, we compared them with two uh, different groups. And one reason, or there's two reasons why we choose them. First, Ovinida and Neralida uh, both have um, interstitial species within their group as well. Orbinida also has some macrofaunal species. The other thing is Orbinida assisted to a Cyrocopacella, but there was also practical reason. For these two, there are extensive morphological databases available so that we do not have to collect them on our own, but could use them. And we did a principal component analysis on these morphological data. And as you can see, here's a morphospace, which is uh, occupied by Cyrocopacella, is much smaller than that what we see for these two families. Okay, someone might now say, uh, and the same is if we do um, statistical measurement, which is called the multidimensional uh, morphological disparity index, which uses these uh, PCR components, but not just the first two, but all uh, dimensions which explain 95% of the variability. Um, then we see here that, okay, within that, the distances between the individuals or the species of Cyrocapitella but is that where uh, is much lower than between the genera in these two uh, families. So one could say, okay, maybe that's not surprising because we're comparing family with genus there. However, that's not uh, the problem here. It's not about taxonomic hierarchy, which is arbitrary anyway. Uh, we compared that uh, in relation to pairwise genetic distances. Again, 18S, because that's the slowest evolving gene. And you see here now, that's the morphological disparity. Whereas in these genera, they are at relatively low pairwise genetic distances between them, the disparity goes up, it gets really high. Um, whereas when we look at it here in Styrocapitella, it relatively remains constant for a relatively long time, whereas it's here already in a constant phase within Orbinids and Neralids, it's not changing much. And then, when we get to larger distances, mostly comparisons to this very different uh, species uh, from South Africa, we see, okay, here now it's going up. But even if we take this, the strongest disparity, morphological disparity we see within Styrocapitella is just as the level as the lowest disparity we see within the family. And especially at this level of uh, genetic uh, divergence we see between. We also uh, did a molecular clock on this. I mean, this is to take with uh, some cautious because we have no fossils for these, they're too small for this. So we used the general molecular clock. We used uh, different genes, 18F, CO1. Uh, we get the same results over and over. So, and with different taxon samples, we also get the same, uh, roughly the same ages. So we have some confidence in that. But as I said, there is an error bar, which I did not include here, but it's not that big that it will change the major conclusion. So when we look at this, this is now here, you see the time axis, and here is now uh, we map the different morphotypes on the tree and when they're most likely evolved, or when the both most likely and most pongemonomously, that's the same, the results were the same. So we see that morphotype two um, 
the latest evolved here, we cannot say how the ancestor looked. It could be either the red morphotype or the green morphotype. But this morphotype too definitely was present at this split here. And that's about 140 million years ago. So since that point, it, uh, uh, this remains the same. It goes, we find this still nowadays in Australis and Fucata. Then the next morphotype, which evolved out of the morphotype 2, is this one here, uh, morphotype 4. And that happened about 65 million years ago. And morphotype 3, then, that's a classic, the traditional subterranean morphotype, which was in the original description, evolved about 80 million years ago. And here we have two European species and uh, one American species. So they evolved at about that time. Uh, it's quite some long time away, they did not change. Um, even if we take uh, the 95% confidence interval at the most minimum age, that would mean for this one, that's still 86 million years ago. So quite substantial time. Um, and then we are already at the 5% margin, or the 2.5% margins to the lower bound of our age action estimate. So essentially that means the morphotype 2 evolved uh, when the dinosaurs were still present on Earth and uh, has remained that still then. So it clearly survived them. So in a way what we see here is what you could call a living fossil. And now we come to the little bit more uh, general perspective where it puts that in and with the title. Um, Stasis has been discussed with respect to living fossils, but living fossils in their name remain or require that there is a fossil. And uh, so in ours can only be theoretical living fossils. Stasis has also brought into account with punctuated equilibrium. And I know there was a lot of debate about it and the most of the debate actually didn't uh, so much center around the aspect of punctuated equilibrium, that there might be areas of stasis but that all change is associated with cladogenesis. So that if there is a morphological change, that means there are two new species. Whereas gradualism always thinks that there's also the possibility for anagenesis, so that there can be changed without speciation. That I'm not interested in. I'm interested in this aspect that there is, and in paleontology there's ample record that there might be no change what can be observed, so that there are long stretches of periods where there's no change. However, the interesting aspect is, so in macroevolution, that's a big debate. What is caused and what causes that on the microevolutionary level, that's not happening at all. And there seems to be there's only change going on. That it, all the indications are that there is no possibility or that status does not occur. And with this, cryptic species might have uh, something to say in that respect. Because cryptic species, here's a review we did on these in 2018, they are strongly increasing and are more and more recognized in the literature and it's all over the tree of life. And so it also includes myofaunal species. And one of the processes we discussed in that paper which could lead to cryptic species is TARDIS. And so I think with when we discuss TARDIS, we also should bring into this account cryptic species and myofaunal organisms could be a very good tool into this because a lot of cryptic species occur in myofaunal organisms and uh, many of them actually have not changed for quite some time if the dating has been done. And so we wanted to go on a little bit further now and start maybe if we could use these systems where we have access to genetic data to look a little bit into causes maybe of stars and we are just starting with it and you see did some first studies in this direction and this is slide uh, what you see it to say this could be seen now in the bigger perspective. Uh, what are the causes for change in the evolutionary rate of morphological evolution? So what gets a lot of, it, of sorry, gets a lot of extent, uh, um, attention right now is this adaptive radiations, fast evolution, really quick adaptations to changing environment. And it's often seen uh, evolvability because they have a high evolvability. These are the evolutionary successful species and they might be the ones who are met, uh, most likely to adapt to climate change because they can change so fast. On the other hand, we have these very slowly evolving species, or at least at the morphological level, very slowly evolving species. And they don't seem to change at all. And I brought you one example now with the Styrocopatella here. It's well you know, known in the paleontological record. So then maybe there should be also more emphasis on this. And uh, what has been put forward in the macroevolutionary um, literature for what could be causing um, 
um, studies. One is stabilizing selection. If you go through the papers, and that's especially in relation to uh, cryptic species, that's often put in as kind of a Deus Ex Machina. The author states, oh, it's stabilizing selection without giving any detail what they think how the stabilizing selection works and what are the causes for the stabilizing uh, selection. However, there have been some ideas what could cause these stabilizing selections because uh, what you have to have in mind, and Hunton and Hull pointed that out, is the stabilizing selection has to maintain a stabilizing effect for millions of years to cause starvation. And if, you, if we think about how much change in abiotic factors alone happen in millions of years, it seems very unlikely. So some ideas which have been forwarded to kind of solve this paradox is uh, that there might be niche conservatism which has uh, combined with efficient dispersal. So that these species are very effective finding their niche which changes in their locality on Earth but not in their properties. The other one which has been put forward is uh, that uh, the selective optimum fluctuates along term stable mean. So that there is some variability in it. The uh, other one is that there is actually something like hybrid stable niches, so that there is some which don't change over millennia. Another which has been forward is that uh, actually directional selection, the counterpart to stabilizing selection, is prevented due to selective forces which work on other parts of the original state and prevent uh, that there's a possibility to go into this direction. What has been else put forward is that there are some constraints which uh, don't allow for further evolution. Uh, so these, for example, pleiotropic effects, so that the genes which need to change to cause a change have some uh, effect also on other properties uh, of development, uh, physiology or morphology or the body, um, so that this um, cannot change as it would like to because that would be a negative impact on these other parts which also is involved. Others which have been uh, put forward but which cannot be tested by um, more biological data alone, so paleontological data, is that there is low standing genetic variation, that they have a limited rate of evolution so that are not evolving that fast on the molecular level, or to the contrary, uh, this can be uh, addressed by both molecular data but also by uh, morphological data that there's actually a high degree of variability and due to that there is so much space they can occupy that there's actually no peak but that's a flat surface and that is occupied completely by the non-changing species. Another one is that especially with respect to cryptic species that's often put forward that uh, there is shared genetic variation either due to admixture so for example hybridization or uh, ancestral shared genetic variation, for example, due to incomplete news sorting. The other thing which should be pointed out here is that these categories or all these processes are not necessarily mutually exclusive, but that one can mean uh, also, for example, flyoprofit effects can mean that also there's a prevention of directional selection in one direction, so we have both stabilizing selection and constraints, and that they can act on the same time as well. So it's not one and not the others. It can be that's actually a mixture of all these causes. Um, but it's not very well studied and the debate is still going on. And we hope that with uh, cryptic species uh, having a recent day example for stasis, so where we can look at genomic changes, for example, where we maybe can do some experiments if the right species, Styrocopitella might not be the one for that, but where we can do experiments on them we can see uh, or we can contribute to this debate and bring in a different component which paleontological data can't not. And we started to do this now going to a population genomic level. So uh, we did DDRAT on that and I won't go into details uh, with that. And it has a, we concentrated only on the three Atlantic species because these are the most closely related ones. Uh, which has this subterranean morphotype. So all species we are treating now have exactly the same uh, morphology. And when we look on the left hand side, you see uh, there's uh, the phylogeny based on selected genes, the same as we used before. And on the right hand side, you see the DDRAC, so genomic population genomic sampling. They are generally congruent. Um, the three, there are only three specimens uh, placed differently. There's here this one, which is here in 
Jesu Maria Brankwai, which is here sisted to Subterranean, so it's not in the same group as here. Then we have this one from Jesu Maria Brankwai, which is uh, placed within Subterranea, and here we have this one, which is placed within Vestidia. If you wonder about this, this is um, how much data they share, because with the rat data, um, and we had to use whole genome amplifications because they're so tiny, uh, there were some problems. And given that they're so old, they are 18 million years still, uh, no, these are 12 million years still separated, no, 18, sorry, 18 million years still separated from each other, that for rat already quite old, so we might have a high, what's called allelic dropout. So that is just, that's a mutation, uh, which we then won't sequence that low side any longer. And therefore we have high levels of uh, missing data. And therefore we were interested if maybe this misplacement here is to missing data. Um, and they, the ones which are misplaced, they have high degrees of uh, missingness to the other pairs, but it's not the explanation per se. We don't think that's the pure reason it might be for this one, uh, but we can't prove that uh, with certainty. And what we also did is we just tried to reconstruct uh, a tree which is based on these shared pairwise data so that they have something in common. And when we use that, and we also did that with paired missing data, when we do both, they don't group together. They, uh, it's not that we can reflect with this the phylogeny we see here or the misplaced factor. So it is an indication that this is not due to missing data, that there is a true biological reason behind it. The interesting part is the ones which are misplaced here, they are not in sympatric population. They are from allopatric population. So where they were collected, they, there we find only species of Stigocapitella uh, Jose Maria Brancai and none uh, of Subterranea and Vestidia. We also looked at the network and that looks a little bit different. And I, this is probably what gets us closer to the whole story. So we have still one species and this will remain, so I can already say that, which is placed here, which is clearly placed uh, away from your Samaria Bankai. However, all other species, uh, they are more or less grouped together on the same more or less long branch. Here you have the group of Sopranea, here's Vestidia, and here is your Samaria Bankai. But we have some which are more closely to the center of the network. They are drawn towards the center. This includes the ones which are misplaced in the phylogenetic tree. So the misplacement could be maybe in part due to that they are more drawn towards shared genetic information. And uh, the other thing is that there are more species drawn towards the center. It's especially true for Yosemite Branchi, and it's overall much more stretched out than these two. So it's a much shows much more genetic variability than the other two species. We also look at it with a principal component analysis and multidimensional scaling. <coughs> And again, this one species here is placed with uh, Subterranea from Yosemaria Brankai, and here is the same. So we have this one species misplaced. Otherwise, they are pretty uh, close to each other, especially in the multidimensional block. These two species, uh, Vestidia and Subterranea, are relatively close to each other, whereas Yosemaria Brankai is separated or spread out much more. In a certain way, this makes sense because Yosemite Brankai is a sister to these two, to the clade of these two. So it, it's the older one, so that might make sense that they have more variability, whereas this is more restricted. Um, I just saw that. The other thing is uh, why we choose this, and we have put more trust in this, that uh, PCA is susceptible to missingness. It uh, calculates missing data, but in that calculation, it pulls these specimens more to the center. And this is what happens with all of these species they are pulled towards the center. Whereas here we don't have this pull towards the center. So here missingness is a lesser, of lesser influence. We also looked at this with uh, admixture analysis. And this is what you can see now here. Also there we see that there is shared ancestry for some. So we see that within all three. So you see that it's not clear like we have here all green, here's all purple and here's all red. There is shared uh, between them. We see the least for the species which belong to Vestidia, but we see some signal in Yosemaria Branca for species from Vestidia. Interestingly, we don't see any signal in Subterranea, which is a sister species. Um, 
We also see in Septuania that there's some shared ancestry with your Samaria branchi, and the other way around. We still have this one oddball here. It's still the same, very same specimen. It's all over. It's always the oddball. And uh, I can already say we don't have an idea why that is. Uh, that's something maybe to look into culture. The other thing is that sympatric population, these are the ones which are here in bold. They are less affected in these two species. These ones where I show, this is the allopatric, and here's also the sympatric population. They are clearly belong to this one species. Uh, whereas in uh, Subterranea, we see, okay, they are also affected by this, but to a degree which is similar to the other the allopatric species. So it's not that they stick out, which you would expect if we have recent gene flow going on. Then it should be in the sympatric populations and not in the allopatric population. And I guess I said one specimen sticks out. Yeah, um, we also did some, or you say, but I said, did some modeling on it. Uh, he looked in how uh, we, we modeled or uh, different scenarios of gene flow was modeled in this, which you can do with fast and cold. And here we have different scenarios of gene flow scenarios. So here it's only between the two sister species, Subterranea and Vestidia. Here it's only between these ancient lineages. Here is no gene flow at all. Here is only between the European limit, uh, lineages because these are still in close proximity to each other. Here is between gene flow all the way uh, between all lineages. Here is only between recently between the two species. European species, here it's only between Yosea branchi and Vestidia, and here it's between all recent possibilities. Um, the higher the value, the more likely it is. So here we see these three values, and these are the three most likely scenarios, whereas the next ones are already about twice as unlikely as these three. So this means there's no evidence for recent gene flow. Um, if you look at this, this more or less follows the scenario of the phylogeny. This is exactly the gene flow which is going on, and we know because there's no gene flow going on, it's no scenario of recent gene flow. This is an agreement uh, with also other measurements we employed, so with F3 statistics, and uh, we don't see any increased polymorphism in sympathetic populations either. So uh, that's what you would expect if there's ongoing gene flow right now, because that's most likely to happen where they occur together. And as I said, they occur within the same 50 cubic centimeters of sediment. So that's uh, half a bottle of a Coca-Cola. And uh, the three most likely, see, they're more or less uh, equally uh, follow, or they're more or less, as I pointed out, follow the phylogeny. The other measurements we did, because that was one of the scenarios, is that there is low standing genetic variation. We don't find any indication of bottlenecks. So there's no indication that we have actually low genetic standing variation in these populations. There are no uh, bottlenecks indications. So from this is what we conclude from this. So we have no recent gene flow. We have no bottlenecks. So the only thing which is on a molecular level left, on the genome level, is, is uh, some form of ancient gene flow or incomplete lineages. At least there's shared ancient signal, which they have. This is what we observe. This fits with the Network data, we see that fits with everything else, except for this one specimen, which is the old form, which we cannot explain really well. Uh, but uh, all of these data indicate that this is what we see, what is shared as a signal is some sort of ancient signal. We cannot say if it's ancient gene flow. So gene flow, which occurred relatively briefly in a short period after, they uh, have separated from each other, so that it was kind of, uh, um, speciation with gene flow scenario going on, or if it happened, or if it's uh, incomplete in sorting. We hope that we can sort this out as soon as we have a genome, because then there are certain managements we can use. And coming to this is that what we are working on, and that proved up to now the most difficult part. And we invested quite a lot of money, but still are not much further than uh, three years ago. We know now the genome, it's quite big. It's 1.8 gigabytes, so it's half a human, almost, or more than half a human. Um, we work with single individuals, so it's 2.6 millimeters long, what we use. So, I mean, that's good because that means we have low heterozygosity. But on the other hand, we get very little material. We get 50 nanograms out of it, 
But for many of these exposures, especially for PEC bio, we need micrograms. So what we use is a whole genome amplification procedure, and that seems to be problematic. And uh, so when we used it for Illumina, we uh, generated 80 gig of data. We then used Nextera, where we got 100 gigs, and that brought us a little bit further. That is at least since then we know the genome size. But given that genome, we did not uh, sequence enough yet. And we also did uh, um, now these long read sequences. We got quite some data there and we got some maximum read, but uh, up to now it doesn't help and we still need to improve this. And in a way, uh, we are waiting now for, because I know Chris Lomer is doing quite a lot uh, in that direct, uh, when he has hopefully published all his exciting results that we can use these to then go further with the genome data on these critters but it proved challenging. So for now, we have to wait a little bit. Okay, with that, I want to conclude now and to summarize. So within the species complex, uh, so far we know uh, 12 species, but as you have seen, uh, there was quite a lot of with black dots. Um, and I know from Japanese colleagues, they found two more species in Japan alone, also at the same beach, which uh, to show two of these morphotypes and also genetically uh, different. And so there were probably much more than that. So for three years ago, it was only one species. Now we are at 12 and it's growing. Um, we see that there are actually some morphological differences between this, which was not recognized before, which were seen as being just uh, intraspecific differences, but they turn out to be at least at our present knowledge to be interspecific differences. But all in all, they're extremely similar. Most differences are minor, and some species are even morphologically identical. So we cannot, we can only separate them based on molecular data. What we don't know is uh, if they have different properties uh, in diet, in uh, physiology, which makes them different. I mean, as it looks, there's no hybridization going on, so somehow they seem to recognize each other as different, even if they occur together. Uh, but that's uh, still, I mean, I want to first do further research with this, so there's still a lot to do with that. Um, and some of these morphotypes did not change at all for tens of millions of years. And given, I mean, we're pretty confident in that number, but even if we go to the lowest number, it's 86 million years, so it's still tens of millions of years that that morphotype didn't change. Uh, in that case, Tyrocapitella species show an extreme case of stasis. Uh, and it's probably now a good system to study using for neontological species to complement the paleontological research on that. With all the tools that we have for existing species, which you can't use for a paleontological species. And we are working on that. What we can exclude, at least for the European ones, is a recent hybridization and bottlenecks, um, that that's the case. And uh, ancient mean flow or incomplete mean sorting is a possibility, but there we have to uh, look further in the moment um, is to say what we see is shared ancient signal. What the cause of this, we don't know. The last thing I want to say maybe with respect to microevolutionary perspectives, and maybe it's time for a paradigm shift, uh, where we talk about what's successful in evolution. And what's evolutionary success is it's really what's uh, adaptive radiation, which has a high evolvability, which can adapt fast, or it's something successful, which maybe is possible to sustain over millions of years with different environmental conditions. I mean, if we just take the last uh, million of years with all the glaciations and where these occur, these species, I mean, it's here in, Nor in Norway, uh, where we are now that was all glaciated back at that time, and they still. Um, they survived all these uh, oscillations of uh, climate change at that time. So maybe we have to think about also in this direction if these slowly evolving genes are actually successful species. I mean, in a way they are because they're still there, but in our thinking we might have to have a paradigm shift. And with this, I want to conclude and thank you first for your attention. Um, these are all the bachelor's students who contributed over the years by C, uh, doing CO1 sequencing or HNS sequencing, ITS sequencing from different populations. So that was a kind of starting point for you see. I have uh, put him on the beginning 
And we had different collaborators uh, involved, Christian Meyer and Günther Pushkin in Osnabrück, uh, which did most of the morphological work uh, for us. And then all of these were involved uh, with the WormNet 2, which allowed me to collect quite a lot. And they also helped me with collecting. Christian Azeus gave us some very um, useful tips where we could find them here in Norway, because he knows them as well and, and has found them. And Dimitra Dimitrov, he uh, helped us with uh, analysis. And yeah, and different funding bodies uh, supported this research in bits and pieces. And as I said, and the most contribution was by my employer, the University of Oslo. So it helps to have eternal funding sometimes. And with that, uh, yeah, that was my presentation. Thank you.